Thank you. I like that. I did spend one year with the Navy, commanded staff college at Newport. It was a real hardship tour, but uh, learned to appreciate the Navy there. Well, thank you for coming today. Uh, I'd like to give you a, a brief overview of our office, the Air Force Operational Energy Office, and where we, what we're trying to do for the Air Force to help the Air Force become more efficient and effective uh, in, in using operational energy. Uh, first, I'd like to talk for a few minutes, and before I start, if you have any questions as we go along, feel free to ask. If I just stand up here and talk the whole time, it's probably going to get pretty dry. So for the Air Force, you know, what is operational energy? The DOD uh, definition is up here, and I'll let you read that for yourselves. But when it comes to the Air Force, it's about keeping the airplanes in the air, and sometimes we have to do that in, in fairly austere locations. As you can see in the right-hand picture, the field uh, convoys going through Pakistan to support our bases in, in Afghanistan. Uh, lost a lot of fuel there, that way, I lost some lives that way. So the better we can make use of our fuel in theater, the, f the less of that we need. Uh, looking forward to other scenarios, we do not foresee a, uh, a conflict with a near-peer competitor where we will not be fuel constrained. So our focus in our office is getting the most combat effectiveness out of the fuel that we're given. Uh, fuel savings is good, saving money is good, and we, we'll take those where we can get them, but we really are focused on combat power. Uh, brief overview, we set guidance policy and uh, mission is to bring Air Force up to speed with technology and data and becoming a more data-informed Air Force in the way we use operational energy. Uh, a large part of this is championing operational energy throughout the Air Force because there's a lot of people, I'd say most people, take energy for granted, uh, whether it's aviation fuel or anything else. Uh, we want to create an energy-optimized Air Force, and like I said, to maximize combat capability for the warfighter. That's what we're all about. We have been, had a stigma in the past of being out to cut people's flying hours, tell them to fly less because we need to save fuel. That is not what we're about. So, ultimate objective, quick trivia question, can anybody identify that airplane? Uh, 22. 22. The 35. 35, Ooh. beautiful. Anyway. See, those two are my favorite ones to pitch at people because they look very similar. So. They both have canted uh, tails? Yep, different degree. Mm -hmm. Inlets are different. You can't see it from this picture, the F-35 has one engine, the F-22 has two, and that's the easiest way to tell if you're not looking head on. But it's, we're all about fueling more fight. Those are the single pilots? Yes. I, there might be some models with two. I don't think so. I think all of the newer, all fifth gen only have one, one man cockpits. Everything's in a simulator until you're actually in the jet. Until they get rid of the F-18 uh, E's, there won't, there won't be a need to have like a dual. Well, they have 15 E's too. E's are, E's are single pilots. Oh, 15's are? 15 Strike Eagles are, are two as well. So, why do we care? Yeah. Well, we've kind of, we're also kind of looking at the fact that before too long, we're not going to have any pilots in the airplanes, at least in the, the fighter aircraft. Uh, there's an argue, uh, argument's been made that the F-35 is going to be the last manned fighter, and then the next one will probably be at least optionally manned. No. That's a ways off given current so budgets. That's the case have unmanned pilots, then you don't have this problem of maybe uh, the risk of landing disaster because you're not losing a life. In the worst case, you're just losing a plane. Correct. Yeah, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of repercussions, a lot of implications of that that would, could really make us more effective and more efficient. Uh, on the other hand, you have to control the airplane. You have to make sure it's only shooting at the right things. Right. And so there's a... So you still have a pilot that will be on the ground. But then you have the, the whole data link to worry about. So it's, it's going to take a while. All the services are moving towards autonomy and uh, remotely piloted vehicles is what the Air Force has now. Uh, they're not autonomous. There's actually somebody flying them somewhere. Uh, we haven't yet taken the next step. And uh, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, ethics and everything else uh, that are entailed with that. Sorry, I feel like we might be railroading your brief. But, but the question about but, that is, as soon as you eliminate a pilot, does that in any way, shape, or form offer or open up um, like the designs of planes because you can have like oh, yeah. kinds of scalability to yep. 
you can, you can you can pull a lot more G's. You don't have to, and you can get a lot more maneuverable, you get a lot smaller, a lot stealthier. Um, there's a lot of advantages to it. The problem is we don't yet have a way to protect, completely protect a data link to keep a pilot in a loop, and we don't have the faith in the AI or the faith in it, in the AI to let them go out there by themselves and figure out what to shoot. So it's, there's going to be a, a ways to go, but it's, it's kind of there on the horizon. Back to operational energy. Um, why we care? The Air Force budget, uh, about 5% of that goes for energy, $6 billion. Of the $6 billion going towards energy, 4.94 goes to fuel for aviation. Most of it for aircraft, some for ground equipment, a very small amount for ground equipment. So that's 2 billion gallons a year, fueling about 800,000 sorties. So it's a big project. Um, we are often asked why we, you know, about installation energy. We, there's another office that looks at installation energy. The Air Force does not consider that operational energy per se. Um, it, it's a small fraction, and when you're in theater, other services, the Army, are responsible for providing energy to the base. Our office isn't concerned with getting energy into the airplanes. However, we, as you'll see later, we do look at the rest of the, the uh, infrastructure as well. Okay, when we, when we stood up and we developed a strategy for, for pursuing this initiative, we started out with the uh, National Defense Strategy. How does it apply? How does operational energy uh, involved? Uh, we looked at the Air Force priorities and uh, focusing particularly on uh, driving innovation and restoring readiness. And then we developed five goals uh, to get us there. It's a little bit picture, picture of the goals. I'm not going to go through them now. The goals are how we're, op or we're organized. We have one division essentially that's pursuing each of these goals, and it's also how the briefing's structured. So we'll start at the top and go on through them. The first area is del deliver optimal uh, operations, planning, execution solutions. That's current operations. That's, I'm the division chief for that effort. And so what are we doing? Uh, right now, we're trying, we are working to execute our field data collection strategy. Uh, FY18 was spent developing the strategy in conjunction with the major commands. Uh, when I took over, there was not a strategy, and what we found out my, even before I came into the office about two years ago was the Air Force was not collecting this data. We could give you data all day long on fuel receipts, how much gas was put into which tail number on which day. No information about how that fuel was used. Uh, was it, whether it was efficiently or not, you know, that airplane did it fly that day, did not fly for three days. We could not match up the data we had with what was done with the, uh, with, with the fuel data, or with the fuel. So that's a major area of focus. I'll talk about data a little more in a second. Uh, we're also teaming with the combatant commands and major commands uh, to try and optimize. And my office, my division particularly, is focused on optimization. Uh, we've found, and uh, we'll have some examples later on, a lot of our planning tools in the Air Force, especially on the support side, uh, air mobility, have lag technology. And so we have outdated tools that does not give the planners the time and ability to actually optimize the operations, which is what we're trying to do. Uh, and then we're going to try to develop strategies to incentivize efficient mission execution. So I'll show you an example later, or in just a minute here. If a wing isn't using its fuel efficiently, it doesn't pay a price. It's not given a fuel budget, it's given the number of flying hours per year. And so there's no incentive at the local level for people to conduct operations more efficiently. And we're trying to work through, uh, develop ways to change that. When you say that, that's more in a local training environment or a local, uh, in other words, that's not an operational well, mission. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, right, if, if you're in the AOR, if you're conducting combat operations, all anybody cares about is there's enough fuel. Get the job done. Right. If you're in a, it, it, and we, this is one area where we need to start talking about costs is in the local training. And our, this example will kind of step us through something we found. But what we found is we didn't have data. We have a huge effort to collect data that's ongoing right now. Uh, a couple of three avenues we're pursuing that I can talk to more in more detail if people are interested. Uh, but it is critical to, to what we're doing. Now this example, um, I'm going to step through about three slides here of some data analysis that we did. And I'll tell you up front, the data that what we did is we collected fuel data for a particular weapon system um, called Mission Design Series, MDS, and uh, found out that the only way we could get the data is from paper forms. 
At the end of the flight, pilot signs the back of the 781H, is what it's called. And here's how much fuel I used. You know, it's takeoff fuel, landing fuel, if I fuel, refueled in air, if I had to dump fuel, it was on the back of that. Those forms were only kept for three months and thrown away. That data was not put anywhere else. So we had a contractor on site going through forms to, to develop the data for this analysis. There's a big database called AFTOC or VAMOS. Yes, the Air Force Total Cost of Ownership Database that has fuel receipt data. They have data in there that has airplane flying hours with no fuel, they have fuel with no hours, they have T-38s flying combat missions, you know, trained aircraft flying combat missions. None of that data, and we, we hired a contractor to try and do this, in no case have we been able to tie that data to what was done with the fuel once it got in the airplane. And that's a problem. If we could have come with a day when we knew the airplane was empty at any point, and for each of the airplanes in the fleet, we might have been able to do that. It, it proved to be insurmountable. So we're pursuing other avenues. So this is a, this deals with a, actually two training locations. Oh, this one is, these numbers are for only one of them. When an airplane goes out on a training mission, comes back, you need to have so much fuel to land and you have, need to have so much fuel to divert. So in this case, the minimum fuel for landing is the red line, the red vertical line, 20,000 pounds. The local guidance was that you need to have 40,000 pounds when you come back in case you have to divert. Uh, you can argue about whether or not that's the right number. We took it as an operational decision and went with it. <coughs> what we expected to see is a, a distribution like this of landing, aircraft landing weights, and, uh, or aircraft landing fuel weights, I should say, with most of them in that range, between the minimum fuel and what you're supposed to get back at the field with. Now there's this little loop out there to the right. Uh, we sometimes do engine running crew chains, changes. So put extra fuel on at the beginning, the land heavier, do a crew change so they can <coughs> use the air aircraft twice without having to shut down and start up. And so that's what we expected to see, is a distribution something like that. This is what the data actually showed. And if you'll notice, the difference between 60,000 pounds and 30,000 pounds, they were flying on average with approximately 30,000 pounds of fuel more than was required uh, for the mission, including ex alternate uh, fuel for alternates and diverting. You burn about 3.5% of the fuel just to carry it. So we're talking about $7 million a year just to carry fuel you didn't need. Uh, this is one weapon system. Uh, <coughs> basically, they didn't know they worked. They thought they were doing things right. You know, it's the way they'd always done it. Uh, and uh, that fuel could have been put to other uses. It could have saved us money. And more importantly, we were able to take that data and tie it to, uh, tie it to data in the maintenance databases. And as it turns out, the airplanes that carried a lot of extra fuel need a lot more maintenance on their landing gear, struts, brakes, tires. Not too surprising. So we, we got this data uh, from a, a, a program set up to evaluate the structural integrity of the aircraft. This was manually collected data by the crew during flight. We didn't know about it when we first started out. The, the contractor that built the airplane has this in a database. They gave it to us. So this goes back 10 years. And uh, we found out that uh, they were carrying, uh, there's a direct correlation. Uh, we did a regression analysis on the direct correlation between the amount of excess fuel carried and landing gear and maintenance functions. Average of 350 extra maintenance hours, maintenance hours per year per aircraft because of that. And across the fleet, there's about 80 aircraft in the fleet. During the course of the year of those aircraft, 41 days an aircraft is gonna be down for maintenance for the landing gear because they're carrying extra, excess fuel. The wink weren't that interested in the money because they don't pay the bill for the fuel. But when we started impacting the readiness because the airplanes aren't available, they started taking a little bit more interest. And so that's, the, that's why we need the data that we've been beating on everybody to try and collect. Each one of the dots represents a Each, type, type model series? Or? I should have said that. Each dot represents an individual aircraft. And so that's the cumulative amount of a excess fuel that aircraft carried over the period of 10 years, you know, between 2,000 so 2, and 4,000 pounds. 40 dots up there. Air Force has got more than 40. This is just one type model series. One type model series. Uh -huh. It's one of the smaller ones. But we found out, and it's a large aircraft. The fighters no, is a different problem. Fighters land almost empty every time. So what we found out is that most heavy aircraft, gives a build, carry more fuel than required. Uh, varying amounts, 30,000 pounds is at the high end, but it tends to be about an hour and a half fuel more than required by regulations and, and, and uh, 
divert requirements. Again, this is the one that we found. Uh, when we found was one of the four, about four percent of the fleet. So if we could address this fleet wide, uh, we think there are gains to be made, both in terms of save, cost savings, but also in terms of readiness. So that's where we're f that's one of our focus areas in current operations. The other one is in the uh, in optimizing how we use the aircraft. And this is a, a, an operational example uh, uh, for tank, tanker planning, obviously. Jigsaw is the name of a, uh, an application that was developed to address this. What happened in 2016, the Air Force Science Board did a tour with uh, the Defense Innovation Unit, at that time, Defense Innovation Unit Experimental, if you've heard of them. And they went and visited the AOR, the CENTCOM AOR. And in the CENTCOM Air Operations Center, uh, they saw the guys doing the tanker planning. It took about six people, eight to 12 hours, to plan the, the, the next day's tanker missions to address the user needs. The tools they had were this whiteboard, spreadsheets, telephone calls, and emails. And the DIU folks, they had some uh, IT execs from Silicon Valley Intel that said, it was basically, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, this, this would look familiar to somebody fighting World War II. And, and we're talking about fighting a near peer with a scheduling process that takes that. Uh, a big problem with this was if you get halfway through the process and something changes, they want to add in a new unit, you have to start over. So while this wasn't yet our effort, DIUX got with a company called Pivotal Software and developed an app. And what they made was essentially an electronic whiteboard. You can actually see the old one behind it still. They still have it for backup. What this did is it's got all the... What's that? For using when the reporter goes No, away. no. These guys, what happened is they, they took four months to get this built. Uh, so it was a really positive uh, in, uh, example of uh, what they call agile software development or DevOps. Uh, the Air Force doesn't do that or hasn't done that in the past. And I don't think DOD has either. But it's the state of the art in civilian industry since the early 2000s. So in four months, they were able to come up with this. And what the difference is here, the, the rows are air refueling tracks. The dots are tankers and fighters that need or have gas. And they put all the math in the background. You don't have to have a guy punching numbers to say, does that tanker have enough to do another receiver on this track at this time? So they took the 12 hour process, actually it was eight to 12 hours, down to about four hours, six guys down to three. And over the course of the first year, they had a 3.8% increase in scheduling efficiency. What that means is about 108,000 pounds of fuel less a week used, or gallons. But more importantly, 1.8 tankers fewer needed to support the effort. It takes about five crews to keep the tanker in theater, between training, spin up, and everything else. So that's you know, eight to ten crews that can be used for other things uh, because of this. You got a question? Yeah, if you don't mind addressing, so from a rotary perspective, uh, I could go out and do the same three-hour mission, and if you come back with, I'm, just, I'm guessing it'd be probably plus or minus 15 percent. Based on how I fly it, like right? Pounds or pounds. Is it not that way with uh, heavy aircraft? Or are you, you pretty much know how you fly it and come back with the same fuel so that makes this predictable? Well, the uh, the fighter community will say they always they take off full and land empty, and that's largely true. Uh, the F thirty five is a little different because it carries so much. Um, that's not the case uh, when you plan a heavy mission. I C one thirty is a tactical aircraft. You come in the day, four, the day prior, you, you flight plan the mission, you figure out how much fuel you're going to need. And it varies considerably from day to day. Uh, if you're going to be doing aerial refueling like in the C-17, uh, and there's some area we can work on there, but you actually flight plan for the mission. You're told to land with about an hour of uh, well, 45 minutes of reserves to, to allow for having to divert because something happened at the runway. If the weather's bad, it's different. Uh, we try to we normalize for all that and all the analysis that we've done. We we take account to that uh, of that and the fact of that variability. Clay, as you're going linearly, you'll land with about as much as you expected. Uh, it depends. It, you know, it varies with airframe. It's about 45 minutes of fuel is what they're supposed to land with. So KC-10, it's going to be a different amount than a C-130. Uh, so, but so you go with minutes, not uh, not gallons. Delta, when they landed at Atlanta, they landed with 25 minutes of fuel. They say they could go with five, the planners do, because they've got so many runways there, but the pilots won't let them do it. But so, yeah, but they, a lot for, if they're transporting something very heavy, the length of the runway becomes a factor. If you know that you have 
fueling support in the area somewhere, you may take off light because that allows you to carry Absolutely. It. Yeah, if, you're, if the C-17 can take off from a 3,500 foot runway, uh, generally you come in, you don't have a lot of fuel, you won't refuel on the ground. But if you're taking something heavy out, you definitely have to trade off fuel for cargo. Uh, it's part of the calculations, and that determines where your next refueling point has to be, whether it's aerial refueling or, or landing. So that, that's all planned on the, well, not on the fly, but, you know, the day prior. What we found in that, that case, the uh, example I showed you where they were landing so heavy was they were doing the fuel planning a week prior. Uh, and we think they were going to standard ramp loads. It's training. All the airplanes are going on different kinds of missions and need different kinds of fuel. From a maintenance perspective, you don't want to have to refuel airplanes at the last minute because they didn't have the manning. So they bump everybody up to what the most demanding mission is, and everybody else flies with a bunch of extra fuel. We think that's what was happening. And so we asked them, well, $7 million a year, how many fuel truck drivers and fuel trucks could you buy to have a rapid refueling capability the morning of? And so they're looking at that. Um, we'll see if it gets anywhere. They don't have the $7 million. DLA has the $7 million. That's the problem. Uh, this example, so after a year, we had 3.8% uh, improvement. Uh, CENTCOM, the people who owned this, said, that is great. We have all these other problems with the AOC planning tools. We want you to fix them next. And so they, they left this as good enough. We looked at it and said, you know, why are people mixing and matching all these tankers and receivers? We can develop an al algorithm that will do that. And that's one of our current efforts. We're funding through, uh, uh, there's a new Air Force laboratory called Kessel Run Labs that is doing agile software development for the Air Force. And we have them producing, it's called Pythagoras. It, it's an optimization algorithm that will let the planners just put in the data. All the users say where they need fuel and when. All tankers say here are the tankers that are available. It gins it for about five minutes. And then the planners are to the point of saying, okay, this makes sense or it doesn't. Uh, you can put in constraints like this airplane actually has to have this tanker at this time and you can, you know, fence that off. Uh, we're about three quarters of the way through development. The initial uh, tests show that on a, on a light day they're saving about 20 percent above the 3.8 percent. So that's a huge, huge difference. Air Mobility Command, we talked to the, uh, the A3 a year ago. His biggest problem was preserving the crew force because they're getting so beat up that their families were, not have it, were getting fed up with it and they were leaving. And so anything that can help us reduce the, uh, the churn on the force and give people more time at home, because they're, you know, I, I think I mentioned earlier, the flying hour program is given to each weapon system you know, to keep their people current. The KC-135 community was uh, overflying that by about 150% every year, and it was just wearing them out. So that is one area where we think we can make a big difference, is we get this this jigsaw, this Pythagoras, a tool to help jigsaw optimize the, the operations, keeping the man in the loop to make sure that it makes sense still and to adjust as necessary. But it also does, and actually what it does right now, is it's allowing them to make changes during execution. Before, if you were two hours into the planning process, you had to start over. Now this data is still there. If somebody falls out, if a tanker falls out or uh, something happens and somebody needs fuel that they didn't expect, they can uh, use this tool to adjust it. The other thing we're paying for is the fact that right now this tool is standalone. The uh, information comes out of the existing command and control systems, it's thumped into Jigsaw, answers made, it's thumped back into the existing command and control systems. We're paying for the development of an uh, application that will actually automate that process. Uh, we found out we can pull it out, but because of the current authority to operate under which the command and control systems are working, we can't push data to it yet. Did it have the, as it is right now, does it have the ability to talk to, say, other inner theater? No. So it's only right in that room. Right. Yeah. That's a nice segue. Uh, I don't have slides, I don't think, for, yeah. We have another initiative underway called Magellan. This is with the Air Mobility Command. The Air Mobility Command owns all the tankers in the world, or at least has command and control over them, uh, with some exceptions. They are in the same situation the folks in the Kayak were before Jigsaw came along. Emails, spreadsheets, telephone calls in order to plan out their tanker uh, allocate, or allocation and planning process. Magellan is starting at the very beginning of the process with the allocators. Uh, it's not really an optimization issue yet because we just need to give them a way to get the data in to the system into an electronic format. 
and it's going to be a collaborative uh, environment where the users and the, the people that need gas and the people that have tankers can work together to build out the plan with the AMC you know basically doing it and you know matching the tankers the, the users and the receivers our next effort uh, which we're actually going to be meeting with Air Mobility Command in the next month to discuss is getting to the optimization portion for them as well and along with that you know we're going to build to linking it to the the uh, jigsaws in the AORs and it has been exported to the uh, Europe, Europe uh, USAFE, as well as PACAF. Uh, it took a lot of recoding because it was made specifically for CENTCOM to begin with. But uh, that's, we're not doing that part of it. We are doing the, trying to come up with a, or help AMC develop a system that's gonna tie all of this together. So that's pretty much what we're doing in current operations. I can give you a lot of more details about that because it's my area of responsibility. Uh, but we also look at, we're also looking ahead and looking on the technology side. Right now we are, are fleet of tankers and receivers, and, and again, we're mostly looking at Air Mobility Command because the top four, you, actually the top two users in the fifth and sixth are Air Mobility Command aircraft. All the airplanes in the past have looked at like that little diagram there on the left, tube and, that tube and wing. More time also? In what way? Attack it with a tactical aircraft, pick up the, the slack. Uh, of course, you have to have more tankers also, but uh, in more time, would still be true that the, the lift guys... The F-15 and F-16 are three and four. So the, there are two fighters that are already three and four, and that's because of their numbers. If we, are, if we buy as many F-35s as we think we are, it's going to be number three as soon as, once we get the whole fleet. But that's like 2027 20, time frame. But, but that's peacetime ops. Correct. In more time? Which is when we really care? It's going to be tough. We're going to be flying the fighters a lot, yeah. but we're going to be flying... There, everybody's going to be flying a lot. So we don't really know how that mix will come out. All we know is there's probably not going to be enough fuel. We have a, uh, a war game, uh, yeah, war gaming section also that I'll talk about in a few minutes where we start looking at those kinds of things. But technology, uh, with the exception of the KC-135, all of our tankers are derivatives of commercial aircraft. Uh, the KC-135 was actually uh, developed by Boeing to be a tanker was subsequently turned into the 707 and made into a, an airliner. That was, that's the only one that's happened to. Cargo airplanes similarly fo follow the same design because in the 50s that's basically how we made airplanes and that's continued to this day. What you see to the right there is uh, called a blended wing or a blended wing body design. Much more efficient. We're talking 30% to 40% fuel efficiency increase by changing to that. So we think it'd be a real shame if the next tanker we build is another commercial aircraft derivative. We get pushback in this area from the Air Force. The Air Force says, well, if it's so great, why, hasn't, why haven't the airliners started doing this? Um, the freight liners, UPS, FedEx, are interested in this, but they've got such small fleets that it's not worth it for the, you know, somebody's going to subsidize the development of it, it's not worth it for the airframe manufacturers to do it. Boeing's building 50 to 60 737s a month, and Airbus is building 50 to 60 a320s a month they're not really motivated to try and do something totally new because they are booked up doing what they're doing right now so we're trying to figure out how to move in this direction we're working with nasa afrl and a couple of other agencies to try and put together a demonstrator this has all been proven in, in with cfd computational fluid dynamics uh, we're trying to put together a, a scale size demonstrator to show that it works and we're, our, the pushback we're getting is everybody kind of believes it already works and says we don't need it the Air Force doesn't want to go that way because they'll be funding all of the development. They want to wait for the commercial side to do it. And it's not going to be cheap. But we're, we're working within the Pentagon for, because they've got what they call KCZ after the KC-46, the next one, to make that one a blended wing body aircraft. It only makes sense. Why would it be any more expensive to build that then? Because they've never done it before. <clears throat> Everything now is a derivative of stuff that's already been done. You just I tweak so the design. Sort of design change still fits the pattern. It's optimizing. Yeah, it's optimizing a known proven pattern. And this is new territory. A lot more risk in it. The other thing about this design is uh, one of the manufacturers is proposing a tactical tanker, which would be smaller, low observable, so we could start getting them closer to the fight than where all of our tankers currently have to stay. And they might be unmanned as well, which would make them even more attritable. So that's what we're trying to that's one of the technology development areas that we are trying to support. So just my kind of recap, this 
airplane design on the right has not been prototyped. So it's Correct. Just, it's just been sort of simulated. There have been some wind tunnel models done, but that's the, that's the most that's been done with it. And, and uh, the few airline companies don't want to invest into that because they don't see a future. So they need... They are more than willing for us to give them money to develop those aircraft. Right. But, but they're, they're not... not going to do it on their own. No. Because they don't see the return on investment at this point. Well, as, their executive, uh, as their executives told us, the Air Force hasn't told us they have that as a requirement. Okay, so getting the Air Force to say, because you're telling me you're going to get a 30% fuel savings. 30% of a big number is a pretty darn big number. And if I remember one of your slides is like $4.6 billion, 30% yep. is like $12 billion. It sounds to me that, you know, that's... It's almost real money, yeah. Um, well... So some more money on a uh, few of our acquisition. Um, isn't an aircraft carry about $12 billion? Yeah. 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 So, yes, um, we've, we make that case. Uh, the Air Force is also trying to develop hypersonic weapons like the Soviets and the China, or the Russians and the Chinese have. We've got the B-21, got the KC-46 currently in production, we've got the F-35 still working through costs on that. Uh, prompt global conventional strike was a thing and there's a lot of competing programs and you know everybody knows you need airlift and air mobility the ones we got work pretty good there's not a lot of push to, to do something absolutely new in and I don't know how into the minutia of the development or you know like uh, design got into this but did it also take into a fact like does it fit all the other constraints that our current fleet is designed to handle. So runway length, like the thickness of the concrete, the height and yep. docking things, the loaders and... Yep. Okay. Oh, the loaders might be, well, the, the both of this one, especially the, second, the middle picture, actually has a conventional ramp and door. It, if you go up to the back of it, it looks like a, a C-17 or, or C-130. Exactly. So the loading's the same. Uh, the, uh, com on the commercial side, they said, well, we'd have to redo all the, you know, what they call airways at the, at the airports. They did it for the A380, and that actually is going away now. But so that's that's not the reason the airline, civilian airlines don't want to do it. Civilian airlines would like to have it, but they are concerned about one thing: if you're in a tube airplane, it's like six seats across, maybe eight. And you make a turn, everybody's kind of in the middle and goes like this. If you're out at the ends of one of these, well, you're going to be like more of an elevator. <laughs> and so that, they, I think it's a false argument. I think if you give people 50 bucks off on that seat out there, they'll pay it. You know, they'll fill those seats. Uh, and people just get used to it. But it's a new thing, and new, new things are hard. Might have to have juice boxes by uh, pouring something in boxes. <laughs> yeah, it could be, well, you, you fly gently anyway. So up here also, we're also looking at advanced ma materials and noise shielding, which comes into the next slide a little bit. Another advantage of these designs is you put the engines on top. Uh, you can make the fans a lot bigger. The bigger the fans, the more efficient. If, you, if you've noticed aircraft from the 60s and 70s versus the airliners today, the, the fans are enormous, but you have to stick them between the wing and the ground, and that gives you some constraints. If you put them on top, you lose that constraint. It also sucks the air off the top of the wing, called re-energizing the boundary layer, which increases efficiency just by doing that. And for the new noise constraints in a lot of places we go, it shields the noise from the ground. So it lowers the IR signature for uh, It does that as well. It, it helps to shield the IR signature. And in the bottom one, uh, they have, I don't, we have, we don't have the picture, we have some where they're actually embedded. Uh, to do that. And so, tactical tanker, bed the engines. It's a, a very aerodynamic design. It's somewhat stealthy or could be made stealthy if we wanted to, depending on which you want to pay for it, but so you can get it closer to where the fighters are and so they don't have to drive all the way back out to get gas. Um, so, those are. Hold approximately the same amount of fuel? Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, the airplane actually, I think, can get a little bit smaller to hold the same amount of fuel. Uh, it's, but it's roughly equivalent. And the cargo, similarly, um, there's a lot, we can go down, there's a lot of things you can do with it, an aircraft of that design that uh, we haven't really talked about yet. We're mostly focused on the fuel efficiency part of it. In design, your weight budget can skew more to the fuel that it carries rather than the uh, structures because you're using better mm -hmm. materials. So there's less weight, there's less, less weight budget assigned to the aircraft right. more to its uh, payload. Yeah, your payload mass fraction goes up. I was looking ahead, looking at the airplanes and 
and the equipment we have now, we have a couple of initiatives there. Lightweight tie downs. Uh, C-17 carries chains to tie down vehicles. Uh, we have 10,000 pound chains, we have 20,000 pound chains. Altogether, those chains weigh 1,000 pounds. They're carrying them on every flight. 3% fuel savings if you get rid of that. So that's what, 30 pounds an hour or so that you, lose, you, don't, you don't burn. Uh, so we're looking at that. Uh, there's a, a winch, a, a nylon or a lightweight winch cable also. The winch cables are kind of dangerous because if you're wheeling on a heavy vehicle and they break, you can really injure people if anybody's in the way. And so it's a very, we have to be very careful about how we do that. If you make it out of the synthetic cables, they just kind of poof and they're, they're done. There's no, they reduce the danger. We're buying those right now because, mostly because of the safety considerations. Uh, there's, AMC's still making a decision on this. Uh, like I said, a thousand pound savings in weight. Um, the uh, load masters like them a lot better because it's a lot easier to carry them around uh, and work with them. Hard to believe that a thousand pounds translates into three percent fuel. I mean, these C-17s are big. So three percent of three percent of, of the weight. So it's three percent of the thousand pounds. So it, it's a it's this, a statistically derived number yeah, yeah. across for large aircraft uh, only. And it varies. And for 130, it's very different. It's not. It's only like one and a half percent or something, and we're not sure why. But for large aircraft, it's about three percent. So whatever you carry, the cost to carry that is at three percent of that weight in fuel per hour. Carrying these lightweight trains, guys, give me three percent less fuel. No. Well, you you do, because you do your fuel planning based on the weight of the aircraft and how far yeah, you're flying. Yeah. It's it's in the de it's in the decimals. So we're not pushing that really hard. It just seems to make sense. The winch cable made a lot of sense from a safety perspective. Active winglets. The winglets on a C-17, for instance, were designed in the 70s. Not, they're not really that great. Uh, so we're looking at, and the KC-135 doesn't have winglets. KC-135 is going to have a, a major mod coming up over the wings, and we're looking at including active winglets up to 10 to 12 percent uh, drag reduction. So what fuel burn. Mean? Because the problem with uh, putting winglets on an airplane not designed for them is when you get gusts, you can overstress the wing because it's making a lot more lift than it was designed. The active is a, a, a small flap that, when it senses the gust, dumps the lift. So it, this one we're trying to get across the finish line right now. They're called micro vanes. We've done computational fluid dynamics has come a long way even since the early 2000s. So a couple guys that used to work for one of the major manufacturers got in their basement and said, you know, we can make airplanes more efficient if we make these little fins and put them in the right place on the fuselage. These 3D printed fins glued to the fuselage, 1.2% fuel saving or drag reduction in fuel savings in cruise. Uh, so 5 million gallons a year, about $10 million a year. Cost to install these right now is about 2.9 million for the whole fleet. They just glue them on. There's a big Put a little template on, maintenance goes out there, puts a glue on, sticks them on. The, the glue we're using is what they use in the F-22 canopy seal. Uh, during the tests, they had to work really hard to get them off because Air Force Material Command wouldn't let us leave them on. We wanted to, Air Mobility Command wanted to leave them on, but they said, nope, they got to come off. And so they were doing everything they could think of, and just having pounding wedges between the, the fin and the skin in order to get the darn things off. Taking the skin off? taking the paint off. And the, the ironic thing is the biggest pushback from Air, Air Force Materiel Command is that we're not sure, we're afraid they might fall off and hurt somebody. You know, they're not proven, so we have to do all this testing. To, we'd like common sense to prevail. We'd like to you know, go with innovation and take a little risk like our Air Force leadership has said, but the bureaucracy in the middle has been a real challenge for us. Has FedEx tried it? What's that? Has FedEx tried it? Southwest. The Canadians have them on 130s. The Navy has them on 130s. 1.7% 1 fuel burn reduction on the 130s in the Navy. Air Mobility Command says they want them, but they're not going to prioritize them high enough to pay for them themselves because they have a lot of stuff to fix. But we're saying, you know, $2.9 million to retrofit 220 aircraft or to glue these onto 220 aircraft is not a lot of money. We own the pro intellectual property because the developers didn't write the contract, right? But so that cost. Is that just a marginal cost, like when they go through their standard? We don't want to do that. Periodic routine. Uh, 
Maybe. Air Force Logistics Management Command wants us to do that, do it that way. It'll take us until 2028 to outfit the fleet. A, the maintainers on the ground at a, a wing can do this in two hours. You 3D print the things. They've got the kits made. I mean, it's a, it's a mylar stencil. They stick to the airplane. They line it up with the rivet, particular rivet joints. There's a little gap where you glue each, of them one, each one of them in. The, you know, a, a squadron of eight C-17s, the maintenance could do that over the weekend. And so we don't see any reason to wait on this. Biggest uh, return on investment, $2 million, or call it $3 million investment, $5 million, save $5 million a year for as long as you fly the airplanes. So we're, we're championing that. Uh, advocacy is a lot of what we do. Um, engines, similarly, on a ATEP, ADAPT, were some initiatives with the Air Force Research Lab and industry. Uh, the upside is the, the engine, like the one in the F-35, but you can get 25 to 30% better fuel efficiency, 20% more power. You've got a third stream going through it. You know, in a, in a turbofan engine, you have a center stream goes through, gets hot, that produces the power. The bypass air stays cold, that produces most of the thrust. This is a third stream that either goes one way or the other depending on the demands. The other advantage is the F-35 is a joint strike fighter. The Marines need to land vertically and they were, uh, the engine was designed for that and so they had to make some trade-offs. Well, if you only upgrade all the non-Marine Corps ones, the Bs and Cs, which is the majority of them, a couple thousand, you don't need that. That's why we get 35 percent, 25 to 30 percent efficiency increase between that and the third stream. So we're advocating for that. Uh, it's a huge investment, and there's not a lot of money, so we don't know how far that's going to go. But the next fighter after the F-35 should have that. Auxiliary power units on aircraft provide power. Go ahead. So would you mind uh, expounding on that? What exactly is different with this, with this engine that you're advocating? So this engine. It's hard to see in the picture. Let me see. Uh, most of the air, or the air that produces the power, most of the time goes right through the middle of the engine. It gets hot. You know, in a, a high bypass engine, eight to twelve, or actually medium bypass engine, eight to twelve percent of the air goes through the middle, or goes around, it and the rest of it goes through the middle. High bypass, you're getting most of the air going around it, like in the big, huge turbo fans. This is looking at during some phases of flight, you need more power. And so you put more of the air through the middle, more uh, fuel into it, and, and generate it. Other phases of flight, you don't. And so you, have, you divert it so more of the air bypasses. You only put as much fuel and air through the middle as you need to maintain flight. And that's where, it gets the advan that's where the efficiency advantage comes in. So this is the first uh, turbojet that is able to manipulate the quantity? I, would, I don't know if it's a variable bypass. Variable bypass? Yeah, very, yeah, it's variable bypass. I don't know that it's the first one, but it's the first one that's come this far in development. And I think they've done it before with just two streams. This is the first time we've had three streams, which gives you the additional flexibility. You know, there's, a, there's some flop over from what we do in the military to what happens on the commercial Boeing. Right. Side. Boeing beats the pants off Airbus sort of regularly. Mm -hmm. Is that partly because of the benefits that... Uh, well, this is all Pratt and & Whitney and GE are working the engines. So yeah, but same story. I mean, we, yeah. And then they get put at the bone. I'm not, I'm, I, I have different ideas why Airbus doesn't do as well, but I, I think a lot of it stems from their governance structure. Yeah. Um, some of this flops over into, into the betterment of the commercial world. Uh, I would think so. Yeah. Uh, they haven't looked at this for commercial aircraft, but, you know, the Rolls-Royce has gone with three spools. Uh, to get kind of the same effect where you have one spool in the middle doing the power, another spool for bypass, and another spool for, actually it's two power spools. One for, uh, one does, what it does, it allows them to turn at different speeds. So each set of compressors and turbines can spin at the speed that's more optimal for it. And so the inner one that spins at one speed, the one in the middle spins at the other, and then the third one just spins the fan. It takes the energy out of the stream and spins the fan. Uh, so it's kind of a different approach with the big high bypass aircraft. I don't know that they've looked at inserting this kind of technology into it yet. Um, their biggest new thing is the geared turbofan. Uh, looking at other things, small turbines, um, you can get them small enough, it gives you more flexibility in like RPAs, uh, 
you know, drones, UAVs, uh, fuel cells, turboelectric generators, and airframe integrated solar, being able to put a, an ISR asset up there for days at a time by reducing the fuel demand by powering a lot of the systems off the uh, solar cells instead of the engine. You guys aren't looking, you're not looking to put those on like C-17s no. or anything? Not yet, we'll see. You'd have to get a lot more power out of the solar cells for it to make sense, and I don't see that happening, but who knows. Okay, then what the third division is logistics and sustainment. Okay. Sorry, one, and I don't, stop me if we're going to wind up getting into it, but um, I know that the Dreamliner from Boeing was like the first plane or the first one that's mass produced. It spun like a, like a fiberglass. Right, it's all composite, right. right. First composite fuselage, yeah. Is that, maybe that's what was in the sign of, or in the design of that um, high, wing hybrid plane, but. It would be, okay. we would anticipate that. We don't, you know, we, we encourage the use of it. We, we see, learn about a promising technology. We have some money, that, some 6.3 money that we can have it further developed. And we've got some mechanisms to do that with commercial industry. So when we see something that's promising, that has a clear path to an application that would benefit the Air Force and operational energy, we'll fund that. Um, and. Composites are more general in nature, so we're not that focused on them per se, except that if a company says, if we use composites or 3D print this component, we'll be able to make this really more efficient component affordable for, for the fleet. That's the kind of stuff we're interested in. I just remember Boeing saying that that was one. Oh, that was, it was very impressive. I mean, there's a, it is, it will be interesting to see if those, those airplanes just might not ever wear out because of that because of the way they're designed. I mean, because it does, composites don't get uh, metal fatigue. <laughs> they, get, they have other problems, but we'll see if those have been addressed well enough. But do you take, say, a composite like carbon fiber? Yeah. I mean, now you have a lighter plane, essentially, right. because you're not using metal. Right. We, would, we would anticipate the, the lifting wing body ones would use a lot of carbon fiber. Uh, it's also because it's more conducive to difficult shapes, the shapes that are difficult to, uh, to, to manufacture using conventional methods because the curves are, are harder to do with metal and, you know, longerons and all that. Your design algorithm spit out an optimized design. The old guys in the labs, the old guys in the shop say, I can't build that. Yep. These composites. Right. Composites and 3D printing. I and mean, yeah. we're 3D printing rocket engines now, so I think, I think we'll get there. On the sustainment side, um, there's two things we're looking at in this picture. We found out that one of the major airlines has hired somebody has hired a contractor that maintains their engines. And what they do is they optimize the distribution of the compressor blades because every compressor blade is a little bit different. So they put them in the ring and they spin them or do some analysis. I'm not, I don't know exactly what that is, but they're getting about two percent increase in efficiency if they do that to their engines when they rebuild them. Um, on the right side is a uh, bringing, trying to bring newer technology to how we do our sustainment. We to inspect blades when the engine goes in for depot. We do a die penetrant. You can see the crack or not. It takes a little bit of time. You might not see it anyway. This uh, thing, it's an IR scanning, IR scanning camera. You stick the compressor blade into a device. It vibrates it at a specific speed. Push the button. You can see the crack because it gets hotter than the rest of it. And so you got about a 10 or 20 second test and just can pop right through them real quick. So we're trying to get the Air Force to do that as well, to convert over to that as well. They already do stuff that's very similar to that to the giant turbines that are in um, destroyers. Yeah, I'm not saying that we're leading the, the way on adopting this technology. We have been lagging, honestly. And so we're trying to get, well, most of the stuff that we've been most successful with so far is stuff that other people are already doing that the boss finds out about because he goes around and visits everybody and brings back to the Air Force. Anyway, another area we're looking at, uh, these are actually out of a helicopter, is coating compressor blades. We're, it wouldn't seem to be an efficiency thing, except that over the life of a blade, especially in a dusty environment, they degrade. And what the coating does, it doesn't make the, air, the, the blade itself more efficient, but it allows it to retain it, its ideal shape longer. 
And so instead of having a, a drop off through the lifestyle up until replacement, you get more of a, a more gradual de degradation in, in efficiency, aerodynamic efficiency of the blade. Is that because it's less, you know, particle, or it's more particle resistant? It is. That it's sacrificial in that you're no. eating away the coating? It's more particle resistant. It's a ceramic coating. A company's been developing it since about, it's been about 10 years now when they first started. And they took, uh, it was on uh, some helicopters being used in Afghanistan. They, the time on wing went from 800 hours to 1,500 hours. So big improvement. And that's, you know, it's a maintenance benefit. That's not our primary area of interest. But the fact is, if you do it on all your airplanes, it'll maintain the fresh out of the box efficiency longer. And that's the direction, that's why we're interested in it. Adds weight? No, not, not significantly. Uh, the other part of logistics and sustainment is looking at war plans. Uh, this, this slide and the next one kind of go together, so I might flip back and forth. If you look at where we, we might need to fight a, a near peer competitor, either in Asia or in Europe, spec, you'll see that there's, there's a tyranny of distance in the Pacific. If you suddenly have a contested environment, all your arrows turn from the green ones to the red ones. So you go, instead of, you know, 12 days, you go to 36 days to get fuel into the theater. Um, that got our attention. You'll notice in Europe, those are the pipelines, fuel pipelines. They all stop at the old East German border. We don't think we'll be fighting in the middle of Germany in the future, and so what are we going to do about that? So we know SEP, Central European Pipeline System. We've, we've lived and loved with it for, a year, for decades. New, new Europe, new NATO, we don't know what's out there, and we're pretty sure that it's owned privately. Yeah. So we don't know if they're willing to accept NATO troops. We don't, we don't know anything about it. So Poland has a really extensive and well-maintained um, rail system. And um, granted, it's not, you can't. It so, so that's, and that's the answer. I mean, that's how right now, in, in the war games, my understanding, I have no direct knowledge, is that it's trucks and, and rail is how you get it from where these pipelines end further east. And it's primarily trucks, really. Yeah, it is. Poland, Poland is like this outlier in that they've been right. afraid of being invaded by Russia for so long. They pumped it, a bunch of money into the refining systems and their rail networks and have bought up a lot of tanker cars. Right. That's what they did as like a national security strategy in order to replicate something similar to that. Do they have any historical data to support these fears of theirs? <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how far back you look. If you look at the last <laughs> yeah, 15 years, yes, yeah, yes, maybe. Yes, 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 and yes. Yeah. <laughs> So our focus area we've, is engaging in war, plan, in war gaming in the Air Force. Uh, this is kind of a diagram of the, how you get fuel to an airplane, ultimately. Up until we started taking part, the only time it was really addressed was this part, the storage. It's all they really looked at in the war games. Uh, we like to say, it was actually told to me, uh, for the air refueling planning, this is a few years back, they just called it the fuel cloud. The fuel would be there. Um, yeah, well, Navy gets the same same spiel. Oh, they wouldn't send us there if we didn't have fuel, so don't worry about it. Right. So we're pushing back on that. Uh, we were observers in Global Engagement 17, and we participated in Global Engagement 18, and actually had fuel played. And we were on the red team saying, and the white team saying, you know, th yeah, you know, the, the adversary is probably going to target your fuel supplies. One, you know, history shows us this. So what happens? Uh, we were, the boss was actually told, this was in 16, I believe, was when he brought this up, was oh, we're only, to we already know that we're gonna run out of weapons before we run out of fuel, so why bother? GE 18 told us that's not really the case. Um, I can't go into details, but when you have lots of airplanes destroyed on the ground because they don't have fuel, uh, that, that started getting people's attention. In fact, we have a, uh, a joint operational energy war game that we're trying to set up for late this summer. Where we're specifically going to look at that. And this ties back into some of the other things, like the winglets on a KC-135, or the uh, finlets on a C-17, or new engines for an F-35. So it's going to cost us, I'm making up a number, $12 billion to put new engines on the F-35s, or maybe it probably won't be that much, $2 billion to put new engines on the F-35. How much, if you're talking about this scenario here, 
and your tankers need 10% less fuel, or we're interesting the B-52s, they need 20% less fuel, your fighters need 25 to 30% less fuel, and your cargo aircraft, if we were to go to one of these other designs, need 30% less fuel. How does that change the equation when you don't have enough fuel? So we're trying to war game that so that to help make the case for these kinds of investments. Sir, personally, sure. my experience was that one of the biggest limitators or limitations was uh, you could leverage commercial capabilities and yet differences between COCOM's requirements on, somebody would say, oh, it, we're okay with using just Jet A1. And then they'd get into Europe and the same aircraft, it's the same mm -hmm. it's high quality fuel, they're running all the commercial planes off it and they would say, nope, we need you know, JP8. We don't, the Air Force has gone over to J, Jet A and Jet A1, yes. period, dot. And so that was like 2015 yeah. or so. And it instantaneously lifted this burden of, oh crap, yeah. how are you going to get fuel over there when you didn't have some administrative burnt, uh, Right. No, yeah, absolutely right. My concern is that if you turn to the commercial world in a time of heightened tension, the insurance rate, rates will be so high, the commercial guys will not be there. And that's, and that's the problem. Is some of the, right. the so infrastructure, yeah. you go to this, this slide. Is you might sabotage the fuel. Right. Okay, without either the commercial activity knowing it or even Playing yeah, a lot. Right. So that's that's way too sophisticated. Right now, if you look at our war plans, this part here happens in places that no honest person is going to say we're going to be accessible or usable. So it doesn't matter about all this out here if you don't have access to those places. Well, at the end of the day, you still end up relying on somebody that's not under your drift control anyway. So right. You're just going to move the problem further up the pipeline. Right. It'd be better to move the problem out of the range of the enemy's weapons. So that, that's the problem that we've run into in some of the war games is, you really? You know, because we, you know, the, the, the war game and the, the rules going into the war game in the past has been, oh, that wouldn't be targeted. Yeah, but that's not what Intel guys are saying. You know, that's not what the, the A2 is saying. So we, do we really want to sign up for that much risk? And that, so basically what we're using that, all of that analysis is, to make the kinds of investments that will help us not need that as much. There are still some intractable places in the world to go fight, but uh, if we take some steps now, we can at least mitigate it to some extent. Of course, it's, we're just trying to bring, make the information available for decision makers so they can make those trade-offs. I mean, we, we want to push it as far as we can. The last uh, areas that I'm going to talk about is uh, our outreach, strategic communications. We hired a uh, person that does only that, and it's been huge. Uh, we, we get a lot of, we've gotten a lot of articles, not a lot, but we've gotten articles into some like Defense News and, and publications like that. Uh, we've got uh, a course being stood up, two courses on operational energy at AFIT this year that didn't exist before. Uh, we've got, uh, and these are some of the products that we've put together. Air Mobility Command has a course that all their new aircraft commanders go through. We're briefing that. We've made materials for that, and that gets briefed. All the new wing commanders get it as well. So that's our, our outreach and education part. So that we can, and actually at the Air Force Academy as well, we have a colonel who's on the faculty who's also a, who's a colonel reservist working for us uh, to, do, to tap into them for some, both some, do some studies for us, but also to get people to start thinking about this uh, in, you know, on day to day. It's not just coming down from above. This is just the smarter way of doing you know, fighting the war. This isn't, shouldn't be anything new or, or different. Unfortunately, it is new and different. But uh, in any case, uh, Air Force is, the DOD is going to be the largest uh, fuel, US Air Force will be the largest fuel consumer. We have about 53% of the DOD's entire energy budget is, budget is Air Force aviation fuel. So we have a, bi uh, a big chunk to work on. That's why we're not really looking at installations. Uh, that I said that's like I said it's been handled by another division. We think we have a big enough uh, piece of the pie to work on in front of us that that we have lots of work for years to come before we can get to some of these more sophisticated things that would also help. But we're we're still trying to tackle low hanging fruit at this point. What did you say the uh, percentage was? Fifty. No, 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 not for installations for total. Uh, Fifty-three percent of yeah. total. DOD energy use is aviation fuel. I take it back. It's not not all of that. Fifty three percent is Air Force, but fifty three percent of DOD fuel consumption is aviation fuel, and the Air Force is the biggest chunk of that. Right. 
the Navy uses like 40, about 40. Yeah, but it doesn't include the nuke stuff, right? The no. Right, yeah, we're not, so yeah, nuke's not in there. You're not counting <laughs> jewels, you're counting, yeah. right. right. And so, any additional questions? Uh, this, we'd like to end with this slide because somebody was thinking ahead, somebody was doing something different with stuff that we had in order to strike back at the Japanese in World War II. A lot of people said that wouldn't work. Or so the transportation industry in the United States and the world sucks up a lot of car hydrocarbons. Yes. But there's a threat you know, through the uh, electric cars. There's no threat here, is there, on, on the flight line? Is there any? We would like to go, if we could go electric, uh, if you're saying a threat to using hydrocarbons? Yeah. Is there any so the commercial aviation industry is already starting to look like electric can work for like within a city, air mobility, and up to the, like the regional airline distances with hybrid electric. But once you start going much further than that, really dependent on fossil fuels, unless you can come up with like hydrogen or something uh, like that. Uh, electricity isn't going to do it for the, the heavy aircraft long range type of missions. Uh, so in that way we are, I think we're the same as a commercial industry. And I don't know that we'd go to hybrid electric for the smaller, uh, smaller range stuff because in a war that's just more complexity. Now if it's proven technology we can take off the shelf, we'll take it. Uh, you know, make a helicopter that's you know, only going to go so far and have so much range. It may make sense, I don't know. Sir, so you're talking about um, incentivizing better planning. From DLA Energy's perspective, one of the biggest problems that we always had was customers, so let's say you had a, the Air Force was doing a, uh, like a training engagement with Bulgarians, mm -hmm. like near Sofia. Right. They would go in and say, we're going to need X amount of gallons of fuel. D, uh, DLA Energy would only charge them for what they actually end up using. You would get, they would vastly over plan the total amount of fuel being mm -hmm. really optimistic like oh every day is going to be sunny and everyone right. is going to be so excited to be flying they're not going to want to shut down and go to the bar that night and so like you'd have a gigantic effort in putting a lot of fuel in place and that end up becoming costly because you pay the mortgage far uh, oh yeah and stuff like that. yeah i don't we're not looking at that it does sound like a problem I, I will, I'm glad you brought it up though because we are looking at the incentivizing, I, I wanted to mention it earlier. The Air Force has centralized fuel accounts. Nobody, no wing pays for their own fuel. So there's not much motivation at that level to, to save energy. What we're trying to do is work with Congress because it would take, actually take a change in law and the Air Force to take fuel savings when we, we have something like those micro veins on the C-17s and we say we're saving $5 million a year in fuel and putting into a working capital fund that we can then use to invest only in other energy saving approaches, investments. It's a long, we're getting a lot of resistance, so I'll be, I'll be straight. It's, but we think something like that uh, would help us get around the distance or the lack of incentives for, for making more progress. I'm just saying that better forecasting and turning that into a more accurate demand signal to the fuel provider ends up saving the cost on fuel because that cost then gets rolled into next year's calculation on how much. It's a good point. I don't, I don't know. We haven't looked at, but you bring a, a similar problem we have in cargo. Is that units in the air, basically non-air force units, uh, do not cargo plan very well. They don't meet their timelines, and that ends up costing us a lot. We have nothing. There's nothing we can do about it. To this point, there's no incentive for them to be better at it. And it sounds like with these planners you're talking about, it's the same case. So we are trying to, this is a brand new initiative we just kicked off about three weeks ago, to start looking at how we could incentivize for the cargo planning, getting these other commands, other COCOMs, or, Magica, or the Army and, and the COCOMs to do better cargo planning. Because that costs us a lot. And it costs us in terms of availability of aircraft and everything else. Uh, it, it sounds like that problem would be, would be best addressed with similar incentives. If there is a budget for the amount of how much you know, safety is going to pay for their exercise, if they say, you know, you're going to be charged X percent of any fuel you say you need but don't use, I don't know how you make that happen. But that's, those are the kinds of things we're looking at for this cargo problem. It might be applicable to that kind of problem as well. Uh, we're, that's too far afield from, I don't know, we're going to get it. We, our person that does logistics and sustainment retired, we're getting a new person in a couple weeks. 
I'll bring that up with them and maybe they can start looking into that because they work closely with DLA. In the situation you mentioned, all the incentives are on over ordering. You never want yeah. to run out. Yeah. And right. there's an opportunity for corruption. If there's stuff left over, I can sell it to my friends. Yep. But, I mean, all the incentives are perverse. But if the Air Force planners or NATO planners don't ask for more, it won't be there to be stolen. Right. So that's, that, that's where you need to address it. You need to incentivize the planners somehow. I don't know if, you know, monetary is not going to be very likely, but maybe there can be some incentives to the MAGCOM or the COCOM that's running the exercise. That would be the, the way. And I'll bring it up with our logistics folks. I'm um, a squadron commander if I'm a, uh, somebody on the Air Force side, and I can all of a sudden say I'm making this up, 10% of my fuel, mm -hmm. and the savings go up there where I don't see it. I'm going to fly more. I'm going to tell my guys, you can fly more because it doesn't cost as much gas right. per flight hour, and I don't, I'm not vested in saving those three stars up there whom I've never met any money. Right. I'm vested in your no. getting time in the air. You're absolutely right. It doesn't work quite that way because the, the squadron commander is given a flying hour program. Yeah, right. That's you have to fly out your flying hours, right. and if you don't need them at the end of the year, it's really hard to give them back without taking negative, getting negative responses from your leadership for doing so. Um, but one of the things we were trying to address, there was a time back in the 90s when the wings owned their fuel accounts. And they saved a lot of, they flew a lot more efficiently. And then somebody got a great idea about upgrading the Oak Club with the savings and that stopped. That's when it, it was that kind of misuse of the savings is what stopped it. So that's why we're trying to go to the, be able to have a non-biased, so to speak, party distribute the savings wisely afterwards. Well, Back to the units, if we can. That jigsaw yeah. will probably help a lot. Especially Jigs if you can get that to tie into other systems. Right. And especially into other instances of jigsaw. Within the so the OR department here does that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. It has RASP, which is uh, for use for the uh, CLF the tankers, meeting the combatants out there in, uh -huh. a, in an optimized ballet dance. Yeah. Uh, we have Otter, which tells you how to set the controls on your uh, surface combatants to get from A to B in a certain time, but it doesn't have to be an average speed. Mm -hmm. So there's mm -hmm. a number of optimization tools out there. Right, we're going to talk about that this afternoon, I think, right. uh, which yeah, is going to be we're great. We're, right. we're the right guys. we got the right guys. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, I think there's a, a lot of benefit there. And it's, it's interesting, though. We get pushback. We have an initiative, another thing that we do called line operations energy uh, analysis. We got all the units. Uh, we, it's re reservists and guardsmen that are airline pilots for the most part, but also qualified in the, the weapon system that they're going out to work with, like the KC-135s this year. We got pushback from the KC-135s. So I said, I haven't seen any reduction in ops tempo since Jigsaw came on. How many air... Haven't seen any what? Ha hasn't seen a reduction in operations tempo since oh, yeah. Jigsaw came online. How many... And he said, how many airplanes were sent back? Well, the fact was they didn't immediately send any airplanes back because they had more work for them to do. On the other hand, we have since learned that when they did the summer surge last summer, because the temperatures go up, you can't carry as much fuel, you need more airplanes, that they, because of Jigsaw, were able, we were able to not do the surge. And, uh, the, the, but the decision was made by AMC says, we can't give you that many airplanes because of all these other problems we have. Make do with what you got. And the way Jigsaw helped is they let them make do with what they got and still do the mission. So it, we still can't quite take credit for it because they didn't do it because of Jigsaw. Jigsaw just let them compensate. So it's, uh, it's an ongoing battle, and that's why the, the outreach and communications part of it is so important. Another thing, that in, at least in Europe, I can't speak to um, Asia, and you do have a lot more space in between different locations that you're going to be operating mm -hmm. over in Asia, but in Europe, another thing that was really beneficial was a robust uh, agreement uh, network with all the NATO partners. So instead of having to worry about getting our own fuel right. three countries over, you're just trucking from yep. like that last five miles or whatever. So. No, that, yeah, that's really important. You're right. Um, I don't think we have that in new NATO yet. Do we? Like, did you have it in, uh, in Bulgaria and Romania? Yes. So they, some of those smaller countries like that are more interested open. in working with us. Yeah. yeah. They're more open to, to working with us because it provides them with capabilities. It provides them with. Yep. Well, that, that and they're more concerned about the Russians, to be quite honest. Sure. It's, it's not, um, it has nothing really to do with NATO. It's just because they're already very strong partners. Mm -hmm. that, you know, they're all bilateral agreements. So it was one of the last things that I was working on, which would never come to fruition, but was 
creating essentially a network of a multi-agreement system. Because currently what we do is you take a big player like England, we, mm -hmm. we, they own the facility in Singapore and we dump a ton of fuel into Singapore. They own the pipeline system in the UK and we just are constantly drawing fuel out of there and then you balance out what you've put in across there. There you go. But, um, and so that saves a lot of efficiency in them not having to spend extra money in transporting that much fuel to put in right. Singapore. Well, we do have under the, uh, like I said, we just lost our logistics guy and actually the contractor that was working with him who's now back over at DLA. So we do have, but they, we have developed good relations with relationships with DLA because of the key part that DLA plays in, in getting the fuel to us. And so we are trying to work with them through some of these issues like the standard fuel price and why the Air Force seems to pay more than one would think uh, of the delta between the costs and the price. Uh, but they've been very cooperative and I think we, we're going, we have a good road ahead with them on that. I have one last question. Um, we talked a little bit about fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any plans to deviate from the, uh, the JP-8 or the Jet-1 fuel? Maybe, as you mentioned, hydrogen. Is there anything on the horizon, at least government-supported research, to maybe switch to that? Uh, There's a lot of work. Most of it's not led by DOD because the airlines and the energy industry in general is searching frantically. I mean, carbon trading and carbon right. has been such, become such a big issue that there's a lot of interest in that already. We're looking for opportunities. If the technology matures to a level where we can see a path for adoption in the Air Force. Biofuels? We get interest. Biofuels, we, we track. Particularly for you know, your K&C no. planes. We, we track biofuels carefully. We, the, our logistics guy does that. And we have a process that go through every time one pops up. It's evaluated to make sure it's compatible, and then we track the price. And once the price of the feedstocks, if they went, or when they eventually get down to being competitive with petroleum, we'll go that way. But uh, we have a budget. We're going to go with whatever's cheapest. And uh, but we are keeping an eye on all of that. And because uh, I, I just don't know if you know maybe one fuel has better efficiency than another. Like there, if I it put does. Eighty-seven in my tank. Yep. Or if I put 92 in my tank and I put 92, guess what? I get to go a lot farther because I get even. I may pay a little premium, right. but I can go a lot farther on it. And that's well, sort of the genesis of my question. Yeah, one of the windmills we're not tilting at that we thought about was why the U.S. we buy Jet A, overseas we buy Jet A1. For the military, Jet A1 has a few additional additives that we'd like, and we'd like the airline industry to use Jet A one in the U.S. as well. Why is Jet A the de facto standard in the U.S. and nowhere else in the world? We decided not to take that on just because it's too big. But it's, you know, for us, for the Air Force, we'd rather have a Jet A everywhere, including the U.S., because it's the closest to JP-8. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we never did find out what the real answer was. So all our, all the stand, standard answer is all the U.S. refineries are set up to make Jet A, not Jet A-1. Uh, but an in air, airline industry, doesn't seem that interested. They don't seem to have a problem with it. Their engines fly both just as well on either one. The A1 has some better anti-icing stuff that we're interested in. But, but so there's our, like I said, our logistics and sustainment folks look at those kinds of things and try and figure out how we can best interact with industry and uh, both the aviation industry and the energy industry on uh, new ideas and, and alternatives. Okay. Any other questions? It's my all season. No? Okay. Well, Carl, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.